my talk is about uh, tailored tailored firmware emulation. Uh, Army of Undead was just yeah the next best uh, title which would fit into that topic. Uh, I have researched all of that um, all of that stuff at the University of Technology in Vienna. It's called TU Wien, but yeah. And I have done a lot of case studies, um, which I want to, to present um, during this talk at uh, the company I work for, uh, which is SecConsult. It's a company which is acting worldwide. So I'm obviously sitting uh, in the office in Vienna, but we have also a lot of offices uh, in Asia and in North America. And yeah, I have also a lot of uh, colleagues which are doing research and pen testing of embedded devices, firmware, hardware, whatever, uh, in in Europe, especially in Europe, but also in Asia. And yeah, that's just a tip of, of research, what we have done uh, during our work. About me, uh, I'm Thomas. I have spoken at previous conferences in uh, Asia and Europe, also at Hack in the Box um, last year in the Netherlands. And yeah, you can reach me via this email address uh, I don't have Twitter, but you can uh, ping me on on LinkedIn too, or on, on Xing, whatever. And yeah, that's it. So the outline, what, what I will be talking about um, today is the question, what is the, the topic about? Because firmware emulation is not the same like firmware emulation, so it can be um, firmware, which is uh, one compiled binary, um, a little thing, which is um, burned into a, a chip um, without any external memory, but it can also be a whole operating system uh, and not uh, one compiled thing, um, which includes file systems, uh, which include may include uh, some IO devices and whatever. And yeah, why why did I do all this uh, research uh, about firmware, about emulation, and yeah, what is it about? Uh, also, uh, some some clues about firmware development, uh, with how it is done nowadays, how it was done, and especially um, all these uh, depending supply chains, which are in between. Um, that's a really funny thing because um, I, as, as pen tester and also my, my colleagues uh, have seen a lot of stuff and a lot of things, how firmware was developed or yeah, how it looked like, how it was developed. And you, you often find some uh, mistakes, some bugs, some vulnerabilities in one firmware and in completely different firmwares because they may have used the same code, but yeah, that's another thing. Uh, and then I want to start with, um, with the project I have done, what I want to talk about today about the firmware emulation, uh, the detection of the essential parts. So just, um, just how to, um, to look into the firmware, uh, how to detect, um, yeah, things that you will need uh, during the preparation of this undead uh, firmwares or this these uh, fake firmwares. Um, a colleague of mine have called it Frankenstein firmwares, also uh, a funny name. And yeah, then I want to, to show a little uh, demo. I've prepared some uh, emulated firmware, one firmware which I want to start and where I want to to show a small uh, vulnerability that I have uh, found and released uh, with colleagues uh, at the company. And also some, I, I will also uh, give you a clue about how to monitor and debug um, the emulated uh, firmware or the, the processes in this emulated firmware. 
so yeah, so that you can find uh, vulnerabilities and maybe also uh, find uh, blind injections. Uh, which are not easy to see from outside. So when you're pen testing a device, you don't know whether your payload was successful or not because you cannot look into the device. That's another advantage that, that you have uh, when you emulate emulate the firmware. And yeah, I've also done a scale study uh, about um, almost 200 firmwares from uh, 49 different vendors, but um, more about that later. And uh, I've also discovered known and unknown vulnerabilities. So the known vulnerabilities, uh, some of them are pretty old, but um, yeah, they are there still. And um, yeah, I cannot reveal all of the vulnerabilities um, that I and we uh, have found uh, during this research because um, they are not... Uh, not all of them are uh, published uh, now. Some of them are mm, in our responsible disclosure process, so it's it's not completed yet. Um, but yeah, the, the vendors uh, know about that. And others of them, because we have discovered too much, uh, are not communicated now. And then I will also give you uh, a clue about how um, emulation can be improved in the future. And yeah, the conclusion of the whole research um, that I have done. So, um, what is it? What are the expectations? Um, it's an emulation of Linux based firmware with a binary interface. So, no complete real time OS um, like VXWorks, like ECOS, GBOS, TinyOS, whatever there are. A lot of, of uh, real-time operating systems which are small and which are compiled in one monolithic binary including all uh, scheduling uh, and uh, binaries and whatever um, windows which may be interested but i have also seen one windows um, or two windows of firmware until now um, can also be covered with a similar approach but I have not implemented this in, in this prototype, in this uh, process, which I have um, which I have built. And yeah, that's maybe future work. Uh, it's about dynamic analysis. So this means um, I've tested libraries, I've tested uh, networked services as far as it was possible. So it was not always um, doable to start all these network services, but for um, these uh, which which were um, possible to be started. Um, I've done some analysis and also of non-exploits. So um, some yeah proof of concept codes from uh, the internet, from uh, Google Project Zero or whatever I have I found. And uh, this also during uh, runtime. So I've just started up the firmware have um, tried all the exploits, gathered how much uh, ports are open, TCP ports, UDP ports, which processes were started, and so on. And yeah, that was part of the dynamic uh, analysis. Uh, it's, it's also a feasibility study about the workflow to realize simple firmware emulation. So it's 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 not uh, a ready to use tool. It's not something that I can uh, just uh, push on on GitHub. It's it's just few lines of script code uh, for uh, pre analysis, few lines of script code for automating some things. But it's it's not a whole open source project. It's just a feasibility study. And yeah. Um, something about the outcome. Uh, more than 170 firmware images were emulatable across uh, more than uh, 49 vendors. Um, that was impressive. So uh, out of 200, I have not expected that um, it's, it will work that good. But after some tweaking uh, on scripts, on, um, on the workflow, it were really good, but more about the, the outcome later. 
and yeah, advisories that um, have been released based on only emulating the device uh, are really funny because when you communicate with, with the vendor, uh, it's we had one one case where the vendor responded that, hey, can you test this and this on the device? And we just uh, say, no, we, we don't even have the device. So it's just emulation and we have found a lot of vulnerabilities. And he was just, wow, okay, I have not expected that. But yeah, it's, it's funny and uh, it's really cool. And the whole project was uh, started in uh, January 2017. So that feasibility study is uh, not a, a short-term feasibility study. It was uh, done as long-term feasibility study. Yeah. Um, why did I do this? So uh, it can can be do um, it can be used for doing remote testing with certain frame conditions, which means um, yeah you can test the complete embedded system um, without having it. So this was um, especially cool for um, our lockdown that we have here in Austria because I can test. Um, devices with, with frame conditions um, of customers remote and yeah that's that's uh, really nice and it was also helpful for past research projects for past customer projects um, where we have done emulation and used it uh, for for example for unpacking or for um, Doing doing some uh, binary execution stuff, which you cannot do on your um, on your desktop computer because of the architecture and the OS and the kernel and so on. And yeah, uh, currently dynamic analysis is uh, just limited to a few architectures like ARM and MIPS. So that were the the projects um, projects that I have found on the internet uh, about this. And yeah, I wanted to extend this. And also the, the static analysis, which is well covered um, by commercial, non-commercial solutions, um, was another point where I, th I thought, okay, when static analysis is, is now that good uh, researched, why don't we have to do dynamic analysis? Why uh, can't we do just, um, just let the firmware run on any architecture? And yeah, tools of that, you might know them, are FirmWalker, Facts, IoT Inspector, and yeah, so on. So nowadays, uh, nobody wants to work twice. Um, yeah, even any work. So uh, some developers try to, to do it really, really fast. Um, which means sometimes copying uh, code from other vendors. That's also a point that we have we have seen during the study. Um, but build root is one of the most handiest tool that I've ever seen for developing uh, embedded systems, and it's it's really nice. I have also used it uh, during the the study. Uh, a lot of projects regarding developing of embedded devices are sometimes based on um, development kits, hardware development kits, software development kits, firmware uh, development kits, uh, sometimes even uh, to, to integrate uh, cloud communication into the IoT device or into the embedded device, whatever. And some, some projects, some products are just looking like, yeah, uh, collection of uh, development kits in in one thing uh, from totally different uh, vendors all over the world and very often they also have they also have all the vulnerabilities uh, inside uh, of all these uh, development kits that's yeah that's reality and that's also because of end of life, time to market, outsourcing, and whatever uh, you you can uh, collect 
whatever buzzwords you can collect about uh, developing firmware, hardware, software. And yeah, we have seen that for many products in the past. For example, uh, this one, uh, the vendor had to contact the OEM to get a fixed firmware for the vulnerability that he had in his product. And yeah, that's, yeah, that's a thing. Uh, due to the age of the product, uh, we cannot give you a quick answer and so on. Yeah, cumbersome, but it is how it is. And regarding, uh, regarding all the development kits, and uh, outsourcing, of course. Uh, one vendor uh, we had investigated, a colleague of mine uh, had investigated, was uh, Xiongmai. The, the vendor had done white labeling. So uh, you, you could just say, hey, vendor, please, um, please print my label on this IP camera and I can sell it as, um, yeah, my own trademark. Uh, with my own trademark on it. And yeah, that was done for more than 100 um, sub vendors, I think, and was a blog post in the last, no, in, in 2018, I think, but yeah, was a big issue. So yeah, who is developing in-house? Who knows? Um, some words about storage. Uh, which is which is typically used. So embedded systems uh, use, are using uh, storages like SPI flashes, NAND flashes, uh, SD cards, and so on, which you can see here in the pictures. Uh, but it is um, not that easy uh, to burn it on the chips. So it's often done via a programmer, JTAG, uh, or another debug interface. And yeah. Um, you can also flash it directly for SPI, for example, because it's, yeah, this, this small chip uh, on the right side, uh, it's, it's really easy to flash it on it. But for the most of the other things, JTIG is a little bit better. And there is also uh, a, a part of the memory. It's nowadays, it's, it's a part of the memory. Uh, which is called the NVRAM, the non-volatile uh, RAM. Um, it used to be a separate uh, integrated circuit, but now it's often a small partition on a system uh, which is accessed by a kernel module. And that was also a challenge during the setup of the whole uh, emulation uh, framework or emulation script, uh, how do you want to call it? Um, but yeah, it's it's not it's not um, so often used in uh, new developments in my experience, um, but it's present. So um, there's also a lot about distribution, which is done was done via websites usually, sometimes via FTP servers, or some sometimes when it's special hardware then you get a physical mail, uh, where is a USB stick, CD, um, disk, whatever, inside. And some vendors also use uh, push, push messages and the web interface of the device. So for example, Netgear or Ubiquiti, I think, um, they are using push messages. When you open up the web interface, then you will get um, uh, a message uh, where you can see, hey, your firmware is outdated, please uh, upgrade to the last version by clicking on this button. That's also really nice, but the internet, uh, the device uh, needs internet connection, uh, which is not the case for, for all devices. And yeah, that's some, some words about distribution. And when you want to upload it for the most of the customer devices, uh, you can do it via the web interface. Um, just upload the firmware, click on upgrade, wait for the reboot, and that's it. And uh, for other specialized hardware or different hardware, you need uh, to prepare a USB stick or an SD card. And sometimes you can also upload it via TFTP, FTP, 
And in rare cases, it's just possible uh, by doing it via an external programmer like JTAG, but it's, it's often possible via multiple ways. So uh, that was uh, the thing by, um, th that was, um, um, yeah, the, the device upload and the, the distribution of firmware is the one thing uh, where you can just get, or sometimes you just get a partial image, not the, the whole image, uh, which is containing um, all of the information which is inside of the device. And when you extract it from the device, uh, you can get the whole image of uh, the complete IoT embedded device, whatever. And there is all the information inside that you need to emulate it when it is possible. And uh, this can be done via JTAG, ISP, SVD programmers um, when you have when you have programmed an embedded device, you, you know uh, the stuff, but otherwise you just Google it. And you can also do it via chip of techniques. So the storage chips that I have um, shown in the previous slides uh, can be just um, removed from the PCP, uh, then uh, placed into a programmer or flash reader, writer, whatever. And then you can just extract the, the whole firmware image, which is like a hard disk for an, um, yeah desktop PC, and extract it and try to emulate it. And there is all information inside uh, that you need to run the firmware. We have a small project, which is the SEC Consult Extractor, so the SEC Extractor project, uh, which is on GitHub. The, the hardware ends the firmware. Uh, can be uh, downloaded and compiled there. So yeah, you have to to order the hardware um, at a at a PCP shop, for example. But uh, the firmware is just C code, and yeah, that's it. And yeah, uh, we are planning to improve the project a little bit when all of this uh, yeah COVID crisis is over. But let's have a look a little bit a little bit later. Uh, you can extract firmware by doing sniffing on the bus systems, for example, on the um, SPI bus, on the uh, yeah, I2C bus, and so on. And you can also do it via side channel attacks or by using microscopy. But yeah, that's a, a big rabbit hole. And when you want to go down, you can do it. But I think that's um, a topic which will be covered in the last talk today, or is it a, a lab uh, session uh, where more hardware hacking is, is covered? And yeah, there's there are a lot of ways how to extract firmware uh, from from an embedded device. So uh, as I started uh, with this emulation feasibility study, I've First of all, uh, read about uh, public publications um, which were done in the past about multi-architectural firmware emulation. And I've seen two major projects. Uh, the first one was automatic dynamic analysis uh, at the scale. And that was a, a case study from Kostin and um, other researchers. Uh, they were using standards Debian images, uh, which you can just download from the, the Debian site, and used a change root to change the, the root into the target um, firmware and execute firm, firmware, uh, um, yeah, binaries from the firmware and other stuff uh, there. And I think they have also used uh, a lot of automatic scanners uh, to yeah, to scan the, the running image from the outside. And yeah, they have done it with Debian images. So there are a few, they are more or less maintained. You can look on the website. And yeah, the problem is um, you, cannot, you cannot do uh, a lot of things with the kernel because you would need to, to rebuild the whole system and yeah, that's that's not really possible for a, a pre-compiled image. 
Um, then there's also a project called Fermadyne, which is also really nice. And uh, I think it's, it's, yeah, it's also on GitHub. Um, they are using uh, modified kernels with the muzzle libc and use the target, um, the, the firmware file system of the target firmware uh, directly for booting the whole system. So that's also nice, but the thing is, uh, you have to, to do all the, the monitoring, uh, the debugging and so on. You have to do uh, everything um, via QAMO and the kernel itself. And everything which is inside uh, the target uh, firmware file system, all the analysis tools, you, you don't know uh, what is inside. Maybe the vendor has built in more, maybe the vendor has built in less. And both projects are um, apparently covering ARM and MIPS. And yeah, that's yeah, that's that, that are just uh, two architectures, so ARML and uh, MIPSL or MIPS Big Endian. And I wanted to to do more emulation, so I've uh, combined um, these two approaches, so the change route into the target file uh, firmware, with uh, by using a, a own analysis image, so own kernel, own uh, file system with tools. GDB and whatever, uh, and then change route into the target firmware and the modified kernels. And for this, I used a build root, which is the, the handy tool, um, the, the, the tool that you can use to develop um, firmware nowadays. So uh, first of all, before you, you can emulate it, you have to do some preparations. Uh, which includes finding out where the root file system of the, of the firmware is located. Uh, also find out which architecture and instruction is used. So the instruction set is really crucial because uh, ARM yeah, instruction set 4 and ARM instruction set 7 uh, is not really compatible So uh, in both directions. And you have also to find out which uh, C library is used. So there are different C libraries. Um, yeah, the most common C libraries I've seen are MuSilibc, Maslow, and Tulipc. And that's, that's also really important to find out which C library is actually used, but I will uh, cover that a little bit later. And you have to uh, prepare a system startup script which uh, includes all the startup scripts, which um, which are uh, used during the boot up of the firmware. Um, this the, the first binary or the first script, uh, which is started, is usually uh, part of the bootloader argument, which you don't don't have when you don't when you just download the firmware from the internet. Then you may just have a partial image then you don't really have all the, the boot up scripts, maybe just just a part of them, just three of 10 boot up scripts. And yeah, then you want to, to compile your own boot up script, uh, which covers the, the parts which are at least present in your firmware that you have downloaded. So the first is locating the file uh, system, uh, the rootfs. I have thought, okay, that must be really complex to solve, but no, it was easy. Uh, just do it graphically by using a keyword search. So I have just, uh, I think I have written it in 20 lines of code, uh, script code. Uh, you can just um, compile a, a keyword um, array, uh, USR, SBIN, BIN, ETC, and yeah, everything that you know from a, a Unix-based uh, or a Linux-based system, and then you just count the the, the lines um, up to the name of the keyword. Uh, how often they occur, and when you have found the folder, this one which is UBFS uh, in this case, which contains the most keywords, then this one may be your root file system. Sometimes um, there are more, 
uh, root file systems than, than just one. That's yeah, that's that's a thing when there are rescue partitions, for example. And sometimes it's a little bit more complex because uh, the whole the whole embedded system uh, is using multiple partitions, and yeah, then you will get a little bit a little bit lost, or you just copy it manually together. That's a little bit hard, and one thing that I have not solved uh, until now. But yeah, as usual, it's a research project. So yeah, you can also use uh, plausibility checks like are there even executables uh, in the in the slash bin slash s bin or whatever um, uh, folder um, if this is not the case then it may be not the right uh, root file system or uh, the files are maybe decompressed and are just lying around uh, in the in the um, top folder uh, one word for uh, decompressing. I've used uh, binwalk uh, minus me for decompressing all the stuff. So I think uh, most of you know this, this tool. It's, I think, the, the best tool that you can uh, use for decompressing such, um, such uh, firmwares of uh, embed systems. But yeah, I've, I've just used uh, binwalk and for most of the firmware, it, it works really good. Yeah, and one one important message: do not rely on uh, binary names like uh, busybox, bash, ash, sh. Sometimes there are different names. For for example, I have seen cli or tc cli or different names, uh, which are just a bash. And they are just renamed, so uh, this this kind of of search is a little bit better. I have also a, a histogram uh, where you can see that two different uh, root file systems uh, are are detected, and in this case, the slave uh, the slave root file system was detected because it had 18 hits, so 18 sub directories. And the other one, which which is the, the actual root file system, just had 17 hits, so one one hit less. And yeah, but the thing is, you can compile the whole the whole uh, emulation firmware with both of them. So first with the first detected one, then with the second detected one. And yeah, that's that's really cool because you have multiple candidates. So identifying the architecture is another really, really uh, important step uh, during the whole process. So um, using readelf or file is is really good. So readelf minus a can give you a lot of information. So also the, the CPU name, the architecture, maybe whether it is using a vector floating point or not. Um, but Looking for the verb magic string in kernel modules can give you a really, really precise information because uh, it's it's often filled with um, yeah with everything uh, what the, the compiler was using and yeah there you see whether it's ARM which instruction set is it using vector floating point or not sometimes even uh, kernel versions and and so on. And yeah, sometimes you can also find nothing about ver magic uh, in in kernel modules. Sometimes it's it's just empty. Uh, and there you can you can search for keywords like ARM7 TDMI or MIPS32 R5. Some some keywords depending on um, which kind of instruction set or which which first fingerprint you you get from the executables with file. And uh, then you can refine the search uh, for strings, for symbols, for whatever. And when everything fails, I have used this approach too for just one or two firmwares in the whole uh, sample set. Then you can just grab all executables um, regarding ARM, regarding MIPS uh, to find uh, which instruction set is used. It worked for two cases, but yeah. 
it's a really bad success rate. So yeah, the instruction set matters. It's really important. Uh, libraries are also relevant, uh, not not that relevant. So you you can execute uh, binaries, for example, um, for example, uh, just static compiled binaries without knowing the the exact library because when they are static compiled, they won't use a lot of dynamic uh, libraries. But uh, for for executing exploits, for example on uh, glibc or on other libraries uh, in the firmware, you need to know it because then you can choose uh, the right compiler with the, the right um, library, uh, the, the right uh, loader. And yeah, then you, then you have the, the right mapping and uh, can use the, the exploit against the libraries. And sometimes uh, it's also really crucial, for example, for ARM, hard float um, or not, because uh, then you have to, to modify um, the kernel, uh, what you're you're starting up with QEMO. And yeah, that's, that may differ a lot uh, whether you are using hard float or not, because then you can just execute binaries in the firmware or not. And that's, uh, yeah, that's really important. Uh, about this, the script preparation, which I have uh, mentioned before, uh, I have just looked for all the startup scripts uh, at different pr places in the firmwares that I have uh, dissected, and they are, yeah, they are, they are totally different because sometimes they are placed in slash etc, sometimes they are placed in slash etc underscore ro. Sometimes they are placed in another partition, so it's it's really hard uh, to get all the the startup scripts uh, from the from the firmware into one um, yeah one startup script that you are um, that you are firing up until uh, when you are uh, booting the firmware, and yeah that that it's that is really hard uh, until now so. Nowadays, I have uh, cases where the firmware cannot boot because, oh, this um, really common startup script, which is yeah, placed in just another partition, is missing. So copy it and it works. So manual tweaking is always uh, a big thing that you will need for firmware emulation. But yeah, it is how it is. And the best uh, typical startup pointers are slash etc, rcs, or init.d or whatever. So for the for the um, yeah system five specification and yeah for system d it, it works a little bit different, but all in all it's it's the same approach. You just uh, look through the whole image and look where you can find startup scripts, and then you just um, then you just copy it in your own startup script and place that. Uh, in the in the firmware which uh, you prepare to uh, boot up the target. I've also done, uh, yeah, this this uh, evaluation of the of the whole sample set of almost 200 firmwares across the, all the vendors. I found a lot of different combinations of interpreter, of architecture, of yeah, whatever, but you can see, uh, see the the MuCLibc and the libc. These two um, libraries are the most used libraries across all, yeah, firmwares. And others are libc hard float, muscle and muscle hard float, but just a few. And yeah, you can see when you count all these libraries uh, together. It's more than than 200 or more than 199, and uh, the reason for that is that sometimes multiple libraries are used. So sometimes uh, vendors have used SDKs, have used own code, then they have compiled um, their own library, copied the library from the SDK to execute the binaries from the SDK, and 
to execute their own executables, they have just used another library. And that's why you have more than um, more than these 200 uh, firmwares, uh, more libraries than these 200 firmwares are. And when you look at the architectural distribution, you can see that ARM is very often used as a little endian, but not the same for MIPS. So that's one of the reasons why um, the, the projects that I have previously mentioned, Fermatine and the other thing for firmware emulation of uh, Costin, uh, that's why these projects are very focusing on ARM Little Endian and MIPS Big and Little Endian because these architectures are very often used and um, yeah, that's that's the yeah. I think the most architectures that I have seen. And when you look in, on on the other special architectures, for example, MIPS 64, um, Big Endian, it was always in three cases, uh, Cavium Oction, so uh, from Cavium Networks, a uh, special MIPS processor, and I found documentation about that. Uh, on a, a website where I have placed the links here. Uh, maybe after my talk, these links will be not reachable because they hear about that. So I have saved it to the uh, internet archive. You can also find them there and the uh, documents will be available. And that's why uh, why I have uh, done this. Uh, Cavium Oction is one architecture which is not integrated in uh, QAMO. So there is no possibility with QAMO to emulate it, but it's integrated in KVM. So uh, there shouldn't be uh, a lot of work. Maybe it, it will be a lot of work. Uh, I, I do not uh, program uh, on, on this project, but uh, maybe it's it's not that much work uh, than integrating a completely new architecture in QMO. And other special architectures are AVR and ARC5. I've also seen some firmwares there, but yeah, that's that's really just a little part of the whole sample set. So uh, to to build up a whole fake image. Um, Build route is very handy, as I have mentioned multiple times. The pre-analysis of the target firmware is now done. So now we can create a suitable firmware image and a kernel and a user land for analysis with S3, L3, GDB and other um, tools. So you can see a screenshot of a build route here. You can configure anything. So it's and it's it's really easy to do. Um, but you have to know a little bit about uh, build root. So when you work uh, some time with, with this framework, um, yeah, you get comfortable with it and then you can build a firmware really easy. And for security analysis, uh, a cross, cross compiler can also be uh, generated automatically with build root, which is really cool because then you can just um, build your exploits uh, immediately with build root and try it on the on the target firmware. That's really nice. So you have a lot of dev configs, which are the uh, which are the the templates for different architectures for different um, yeah for different systems uh, that you want to build, and also for QEMO, which is really nice because uh, you can just use the dev config for QEMO modify it a little bit, and then you can just emulate uh, ARM firmware or MIPS firmware and really fast. So it's it's not a lot of work that you have to do, but um, you have to get a little bit comfortable with build root, then it's not a big deal. So uh, copying the identified root file system that we have done in the, the pre-analysis, is really straightforward. You just create a subdirectory, copy it in there, and yeah, that's it. After that, you can uh, start the firmware image by using a change route, and then you can switch into your target firmware where you want to do the analysis. And yeah, running all, all startup scripts, maybe 
hard. It is hard finding all of them. But yeah, when you when you don't find all the startup scripts, you can just grab that what you find, um, boot it up, and yeah, it's better than nothing. So you have fun while running partial, as you can see in this picture. The architectures that I have covered during the the project are ARM32 five uh, big Endian, ARM32 five little Endian, and so on. Uh, so a lot of of different architectures, and you can also see uh, on this on this picture also PowerPC Super H, and uh, for example the 32-bit Intel processors, uh, which are nowadays also used for embedded systems, which is really funny, because uh, yeah, a decade ago we have used it on our PCs, but yeah, and. Yeah, um, the the uh, target firmware image um, that that I have found uh, all target firmware images that I have found uh, was directly integrated into the firmware that I have built with um, Build Root. Mm, that's a little bit different to other projects because um, I've seen other projects where it was mounted via NFS. Which I have also done in the in the beginning in 2017, 2018, but it's it's not really optimal for uh, monitoring for debugging because when you when you look at the network traffic, then you will see a lot of NFS traffic um, going back and forth, and yeah, that's 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 not really cool. Also, when you um, disconnect from the network, um, then the target file system is immediately gone and yeah, what do we do then? I don't know. So I have just integrated the whole firmware image that I want to uh, that I want to analyze into the into my built uh, firmware image in, in into my um, yeah in my compiled firmware image, and that you have just then you have just a standalone image that you can just emulate on any PC where you have uh, QAMO. And you can also change uh, the networking config and so on uh, via the command line. And yeah, loading kernel modules is a problematic thing because uh, the kernel must be must fit for 100%. But that's another thing. So have a close uh, look onto uh, the emulation stuff. So that's for example the interface of a build route uh, where you can uh, see which parameters you can modify, but uh, I don't want to go into much details Details there. I've prepared three firmwares, so Moxa, TrendNet, and Netgear, which I have started um, previously. And there you can see just the emulation of the Moxa device, where I can log in and see how it runs. So really smooth. That's one of the uh, Intel processor stuff. And yeah, there you can also just, um, there can also just change networking config and do whatever you want uh, to like. You can also pen test these devices, of course. Uh, I have also, I have also uh, done uh, a Nessus scan on one of these devices, and I have found cross-site scripting in, uh, I think, three different um, endpoints. Not not for this Moxa thing, but for another for another industrial device. And yeah, also a device from TrendNet uh, where you can also log in and look at the settings and so on. And yeah. Some devices just run partial, as mentioned before, and that's, for example, this uh, Netgear uh, device, which is running a, a web server. You can see it here, HTTP, and is running. Uh, yeah, it is running a PowerPC uh, CPU, and this device is is not um, not really serving. HDM or HTML files 
but you can find uh, GIFs which are uh, in the web route and you can also reach CGI uh, endpoints and so on where you can download protocols and whatever. So it's just running parcel and you can test some things but not everything. You can also look um, at the networking config uh, at the, the open ports. Uh, there's a lot of UDP and uh, TCP. Um, uh, th there are a lot of UDP and TCP listeners. And yeah, it's, it's interesting which proce processes are uh, running there. And I have also found for, for other devices, um, yeah, uh, segmentation faults that you can trigger or denial of, denial of service vulnerabilities for uh, different processes, uh, not just not just uh, web interfaces, but yes. I've also um, prepared a little bit of output when you use um, readalf. There you can see that this one, that's one of the Devolo devices, uh, that this is from Arc, or how you can grab for the ver magic um, string, which is uh, not, not really present in the libraries, but Sometimes in the kernel modules, you can see that here. And yeah, I have also uh, one device, uh, which is from Phoenix Contact, where I want to show you how the device boots up. So that's just the analysis VM that I will start now. Uh, you can see how it, how it boots. Uh, and yeah, it will try all the exploits that I have integrated in the, the whole system. Uh, and then it will restart the networking stuff because some devices are um, are adding routes where you cannot uh, reach the device afterwards. And yeah, that's a little bit painful because you see open ports, but the routes are set in that way that you cannot access uh, to the device via the web interface. And yeah, that's not cool. Uh, you can see uh, there were some, yeah, there were some mod probe commands in the, the script, uh, which did not work because the kernel version is different. Because I have uh, compiled an own kernel version with build root, but you can compile a different kernel version so that um, some of the of the modules get loaded and some will crash. But yeah, that's. That's the thing on emulation. And now I think it's booted. Is It has the IP address 108. So, yeah. And that's that's one of the, of the routers from Phoenix Contact. Yeah, it's, it's really nice because you can just pen test the device without having the actual device. Uh, let me switch back. And yeah, uh, monitoring and debugging is, is really nice um, with um, process monitoring, PS, NetStat, TCP dump. Uh, you can look at, at the network traffic, um, which is sent from the device to some, uh, some services on the internet maybe. Uh, and yeah, there are other, other things but I think you, you know uh, how to use S3, L3, uh, wall grind, and so, and so on. And you can also use these tools uh, on the analysis VM where you host uh, this target VM. And yeah, that, that's, that's really nice. That's really comfortable. And you can observe the, the whole behavior of the emulated firmware um, yeah, from sitting next next to the to the running image that's really cool uh, the study samples were from um, different vendors from industrial vendors from network camera vendors and so on and yeah you can just have a look uh, at the slides afterwards the outcome of the whole study um, was that 89 percent were emulatable in terms of executing the, the hull, so um, the shell or bash, busybox, ash, whatever, uh, and executing binaries. I've tested, tested this by uh, executing bash and writing uh, something into a file. Uh, and 
16% of all of the, the images uh, were spawning a TCP listener, 8% were spawning an UDP listener, and yeah, some of the images were not complete, as I have mentioned uh, at the beginning of the talk, because yeah, the, the vendors just provide you a partial image and then you cannot start everything because configs are missing, executes, execute tables are missing and so on. And the known vulnerabilities that I have tested during the study were uh, yeah, get address info, buffer overflow, ghost, and shellshock. Shellshock was just present in one firmware and yeah, ghost in 14% of the, of the sample set and uh, yeah, get address info just in four four percent. But for I think that the age of the CVEs two fifteen that that's really old in images that are just from two thousand twenty and two thousand nineteen. That's yeah painful, but it is how it is. I have one more demo, but I think we are running out of time. Uh, you can uh, click on uh, this on this link, so it's it's clickable, and you will get the slides afterward. It's just a command injection in a Phoenix contact uh, device, which were communicated to the to the vendor and which is um, already published. It's it's really easy, just appending um, dot slash ls dot slash, and then you see a list screen uh, output. And we have also some unpublished um, advisories which are currently pending uh, with the with the, the, the vendor Red Lion um, and Cornix, and they have also a lot of vulnerabilities. But it is um, it is currently pending in our responsible disclosure process, and a lot of more vulnerabilities that must be communicated, but where we had no chance because of a lot of, of internal uh, tasks that were done in the last weeks, in the last two months because of the, the crisis of the corona stuff, you know. And yeah, I wanted to show uh, this, this demo live, but I have also investigated the command injection of the uh, Phoenix contact devices uh, with Gitra. You can see that in line 162, uh, the run shell um, the run shell uh, function is called and it just takes the input, runs it and prints it to the to the screen uh, on the, the HTML output. And yeah, that's that's one of the vulnerabilities which were really easy to spot. And yeah, it, it's really nice with, with Gitra firmware reverse engineering, but I think you will hear something yeah, you will hear a little bit more uh, later um, this day about that. So what are the, the conclusions? Um, firmware emulation with QEMO and build root is really nice. So it, it works really good for some devices which are complete or where the firmware image is complete. And yeah, the approaches that I have tested, I have mentioned it before, uh, pre-compiled images, uh, building everything from the stretch, that's really painful. I don't like that. I'm, I'm too lazy, to be honest. And yeah, using the, the targets uh, firmware file system only is not really comfortable because of you don't have a lot of tools. And uh, observation is also not that easy. And yeah, manual testing is, is really hard. So I've done it in, in this way. And what are the improvements? Uh, you can implement KVM Oction uh, to QEMO. So KVM already uh, exists. Uh, you can also add kernel hopping, where you just um, switch uh, the, the kernel uh, sources on build root, uh, which version should be compiled so that you can load kernel modules. Um, that would be really nice, but it's, it, it, it's uh, a big task because uh, compiling the kernel on my laptop, it takes 30 minutes and yeah, that's not, not that cool. And you can also implement uh, library resolving when all of the, of the files get spread on the uh, top uh, folder. Then you can uh, build up the, the tree by resolving the dependencies, for example, by using scanelf. You can restruct, uh, reconstruct the whole file system by using that method. 
and uh, you can also pre-emulate it by QEMO system emulation or QEMO user emulation for a better architecture detection. So that's it from my side. Um, thank you that uh, I got the opportunity to speak on this live stream. And yeah, back to you. Yeah, because we have run out of time. Um, uh, if people wanted to contact you, how, what is the best way for them to do so? Um, email and LinkedIn. Oh. LinkedIn, you can find me really easy. So it's the same picture that I have used uh, for this presentation. And yeah, email. But I don't have Twitter. So yeah. okay. 